I think we can go ahead and get started. And then as people come in, um, they'll just get caught up. So welcome everyone to uh, UF IFIS, Florida Medical Entomology Laboratories webinar today on communicating with the public about genetically modified mosquitoes. Um, so this webinar was originally attended for um, UF IFIS Extension faculty, as well as Florida mosquito professionals. Then um, we had quite a few more openings that, that became available. So we, um, seats that became available. So we opened this up to a larger audience. So um, we also now have participants from um, mosquito control programs throughout the US. And I also think we may also have some international participants. So certainly welcome to you all. I am Eva Buckner, and I'm just gonna start off with uh, the outline of today's um, presentation where I'm gonna cover. I'm gonna quickly address some housekeeping notes and then um, Eric Caragata and I are gonna provide an introductory PowerPoint presentation. Just quickly go over public controversy, why GM mosquitoes, um, why is this technology being considered? How does the technology work? And then uh, also what the plan for the releases in Florida um, is. Then we're going to shift to a, a panel. Um, section. And um, on this panel, it'll be myself. Um, I am an assistant professor at UF IFAS FMEL. I'm also the state medical entomology extension specialist for UF. Uh, joined, I'll be joined by um, Eric Caragata, who is also um, FMEL assistant professor. Additionally, we have Chad Huff, who is the Florida Keys Mosquito Control District Public Education and Information Officers. But Chad, thank you so much for joining us today. And then we have the incredible Julie McConnell as um, moderator, and she's also um, the webinar co-organizer. Thanks so much, Julie. Um, so um, then after that panel, I'm going to turn it over to Chad and just give him the opportunity to go through any information he thinks um, it's useful to know um, that we haven't covered yet. So like I said, just gonna quickly go over some um, housekeeping tips. Um, since we are in this webinar, you um, attendees' microphones are muted, your cameras are off. So for you to communicate with us, we ask that you use the Q&A little tool, you'll see that in the, the toolbar. Um, use that to ask us questions. Um, and then for the folks that are here attending with Florida Mosquito Control or the folks that are in Florida Mosquito Control programs, I should say, um, these are only gonna be the people that are eligible for the um, license CEU. And I tried to make that clear. Um, so I hope that information was provided and the information was clear. Um, for those folks that are attending, we just ask that in the chat box, if you would just um, enter the names of the people that are attending for the, this is just for um, people from Florida Mosquito Control Programs who are um, attending to get the uh, FDAX Public Health Pest Control License CEU. If you would just enter the names of the people, if there are multiple attendees at the same site, provide the site name and then the names of the attendees. Um, and if you don't mind, let's try and not fill the chat with too many um, unnecessary communications because we are gonna be trying to use that chat box to um, gather information for um, making out your CEUs. So please help us with that. Okay. So just getting right into the presentation, there's certainly no secret 
um, that there is a lot of public controversy surrounding the planned release of GM mosquitoes in the Florida Keys. And this controversy has certainly um, been occurring since there was the original proposal to release um, genetically modified mosquitoes back um, around 2010. So certainly uh, this um, controversy has um, been going on for a while. So certainly the question is, one of the questions is why? Why is there so much controversy surrounding this issue? Um, there have been multiple surveys conducted to try and answer that question. And here on this slide, you can see the results to a, a survey that was conducted in 2015. Um, there were 400 people that were asked to um, answer the survey. They only had about 22% from response rate, which, you know, not everyone responds. So that's not really that terrible. Um, but what I do want to point out is that um, the majority of the people that did respond were not in support of using GM mosquitoes as a mosquito control method. And the reason for them being opposed to this was um, included general fears about harmful um, impacts of the inner intervention, um, worries about human and animal health. So you can see here that uh, making people sick, um, also upsetting the ecosystem. So affects negative impacts of the ecosystem. And there, here are some um, overall concerns um, that may not have been provided as a potential answer. Um, but interestingly, um, the residents were more likely to oppose GM mosquitoes if they had a low perception of the potential risks um, from diseases like um, mosquito-borne diseases like chikungunya and dengue. Um, and also if they had the perception that the possibility of transmission of those diseases within the area that they lived in was unlikely. So I just mentioned um, dengue and chikungunya, disease risk perception, and much of the controversy surrounding the, the release of GM mosquitoes stems from the public's risk perception uh, about certain issues surrounding uh, the release of GM mosquitoes. Um, and what I just wanna mention briefly about risk perception is that it's not necessarily always based on a plausible set of hypotheses. It can be strongly dependent on opinions and um, it can vary a lot and it can be influenced by the media and it can also change very fast. So um, this slide illustrates some of the risk perceptions um, that were provided um, in response this was um, a study that was conducted prior to the release of genetically modified mosquitoes in 2016 in Brazil. Um, sorry, um, this study was conducted in 2016 and, and this was prior to the release of the genetically modified mosquitoes there. And this, so this just gives you, in my opinion, it shows some of the concerns that the public is having. It's you know, it's not just here in the US that these concerns are happening. Uh, and this slide illustrates that there's some of the same concerns and those that I want you just to know about um, is that one of the risk perceptions is that GM mosquitoes may bite people. Um, so what is it that the harm could be due to this risk? And that would be disease transmission here it also, um, this table provides um, the level of the concern and then what the real risk is to um, this issue. Um, so like I said, one of the issues here is that mosquito, GM mosquitoes may bite people. Another 
uh, big concern voiced by the public was that there would be a, a vacant niche occupation um, from the eradication of Aedes aegypti. Um, and so this is, to me, it's very important to see what the perceived risks are versus what the real risk is. And then additionally, there's, um, there was also this, to me, this was very in, interesting to find that there was a, an entire dissertation thesis dedicated to making sense of the public controversy surrounding the release of GM mosquitoes. Um, so in, in addition to the issues of risk perception, one of the off, uh, other contributing factors to the controversy that uh, this dissertation pointed out, and this is just um, me paraphrasing what um, a certain section of the dissertation um, was that those critics um, took on the role of science communicators, um, alternative science communicators, uh, possibly by providing selective information. Uh, and that also in that process, whether it was um, intentional or non-intentional, this allowed for conspiracy theories and rumors to become um, circulated. So um, in addition to, like I said, the, the public uh, risk perception, um, and then we also have this truth that's not the entire truth not being presented. And um, basically it's also misinformation being presented. And this is one example of the uh, GM mosquito misinformation that I would like you to be aware of. <laughs> this is um, on the left side of the screen is a um, publication um, from scientific reports. And this public, this is uh, one of the statements from the publication was that, um, and this was, this study was conducted after the release of genetically modified mosquitoes in Brazil. So, and the study authors um, said that it was very really the hybrid population that result that resulted from mating between the um, genetically modified mosquitoes and the native population of Aedes aegypti uh, would very likely going to result in a more robust population than pre-population due to hybrid vigor. And this came out, the study was published in uh, September, 2019, and this received a lot of attention. Um, and this led to a lot of news articles coming out um, about hybrid vigor and the potential negative impacts um, but what was going on behind the scenes that many people are not aware of, um, because, you know, this isn't necessarily as juicy as the original um, story that came out, was that soon after this was published, the journal received um, concerns about the material that was published, and so um, the editors you know, look, did research into this um, and they, what resulted was that in March of this year, um, the editors provided an, an expression of concern in relation to this article. And there's certainly no way that I'm gonna try and address everything um, that was covered both in the original paper and the, um, editorial expression of concern, but I just want to bring you bring this to your attention um, because this is one study that is commonly cited when um, people are may uh, state that um, this could 
the release could cause hybrid vigor and um, mosquitoes that could possibly be um, better at transmitting viruses. So ultimately, um, some of the statements that were made in that expression of concern was that um, there was no data provided in the article to support the statement about hybrid vigor. Um, and like I said, there's quite a few other things um, stated. And um, I provided the, the web address to this editorial expression of concern. And this will also take you to the um, original article so that you can learn more about it yourselves. Just because don't have time to cover everything. But I certainly wanted to bring that to your attention. So really, um, this webinar, the goal of it is to provide you with the information to help you to provide what is the actual risk for certain issues that are brought up about um, genetically modified mosquitoes. So to help you fight um, what are the risk perceptions and provide what the actual risks are. Um, and also just to help you to combat misinformation. So I uh, just wanna start off by talking about the proposed um, species um, that's being genetically, excuse me, the species that's being genetically modified. Just wanna start off with a little bit of information about um, Aedes aegypti. So we have approximately 90 species of mosquitoes in Florida. There's over, 3,500 species worldwide. So the release or the, there's only this one species of mosquito that is being genetically modified and, and being released. Um, so it, it's only Aedes aegypti and this species is invasive. It, um, it, so it's not native to Florida. Um, it's, it's very invasive. It's one of the most invasive um, mosquito species in the world. Um, and, and now it was originally found in Africa. And now because of it being such an incredible invasive species, it is found across the world in tropical, subtropical, and temperate regions. And um, what makes it an invasive species is that it's not just good at making its way into new locations, it can negatively impact the, um, negatively Im impact human health because um, Aedes aegypti is the most competent vector of dengue, chikungunya, Mayaro virus, um, yellow fever virus, and Zika virus. So um, this species has, really become adapted to living close to humans. Um, so the females will require human blood sometimes. Uh, so they prefer to take human blood meals. Um, so they use the blood to lay their eggs. Um, it's important to note that it's just gonna be genetically modified males, mosquitoes that are going to be released and the male mosquitoes do not bite people. Um, they feed on nectar um, as a source of nutrition. Um, and so another thing to know about Aedes aegypti is that they do, as I said, they live close to humans. They also, in addition to using humans for a source of blood meals, they also use our discarded containers um, that fill with water as their habitats for the uh, immature mosquitoes. Um, and they have, a, a, in comparison to some of our other mosquito species, um, like our salt marsh mosquito, Aedes tenurhynchus, they have a smaller or shorter flight range. So on the previous slide, I listed some of the, the arboviruses that Aedes aegypti is competent, uh, competent vector for. 
and certainly the one that I want to highlight is dengue virus. And, and the reason I want to highlight this is that um, dengue virus is the most important mosquito-borne virus affecting humans. Um, it causes dengue and severe dengue. Um, and there's worldwide 50 to 400 million infections of um, dengue and severe dengue every year. Um, the exact number may be larger, we really don't know. It's um, because some of the infections, actually most of the, the infections are asymptomatic. So in addition to the infections, there are um, approximately 22,000 deaths per year for this, um, the diseases caused by dengue virus. So just keep in mind that these are, these, um, these deaths, these infections, this is just for one of the viruses that Aedes aegypti is um, the best mosquito at transmitting these um, viruses. So, um, so just talking a little bit about severe dengue fever, um, it's typically when people have severe dengue fever, they can, um, can potentially result in death. And so it's usually about 5% of dengue fever cases that develop into severe dengue. Um, and then a secondary infection of a, a different dengue serotype increases the risk of having more severe symptoms. Um, and you can see what some of the symptoms are here on the slide, um, but certainly not anything uh, any symptoms that anyone wants to experience. So just talking about uh, Florida now where the proposed release is going to be occurring. Um, in 2019, we had um, 16 locally transmitted cases of, of dengue virus. And then in 2020, we've had a huge jump in uh, locally transmitted cases of dengue virus. And actually 2020 has been uh, the year with the most uh, documented locally transmitted cases in a, in a long time. So um, it's been a record breaking year, uh, both for um, dengue virus. And we've also had uh, a very bad West Nile virus year here in Florida. That's another <laughs> webinar. So not gonna get into that. Um, but specifically there have been 67 cases in Monroe County. And so Monroe County, for those of you not in Florida, just wanna let you know that that is the county that the Florida Keys are located in. And then the county just north of the Florida Keys is Miami-Dade, or Monroe County, sorry, um, the county just north of um, Monroe County that has the Florida Keys in it is going to be Miami-Dade County. And there's been three cases of dengue in that county. And just also in throughout the areas where we have Aedes aegypti in Florida, there's always the risk of dengue virus transmission. Um, now, one thing I, I do wanna say is that dengue virus is not an endemic virus here um, in the continental US. So what's necessary for this um, transmission to occur would be someone that has the virus and is infected to come into the area where a location in Florida where the Aedes aegypti is present, um, and then for the local mosquitoes to bite that person, become infected, and then um, bite another person. So that's what's needed for the transmission to occur, but it's certainly possible where the species are present. And that's certainly gonna be um, Monroe County, uh, Miami-Dade County, um, and a recent study conducted showed that there's um, about 20 counties in the in Florida that have 
um, 80s aegypti present, and it's possible that the range is also expanding. So we've, I've talked about dengue virus um, and uh, infections and deaths caused by just that one virus um, throughout the world and also um, specifically to Florida. So this really ties in to why GM mosquitoes are being explored um, as a mosquito control tool. So um, certainly, um, as I mentioned, this vector is um, it can responsible for um, dengue virus transmission, and this is the um, most important arbovirus currently affecting the world. So there's a lot of costs involved in public health. This mosquito costs a lot to public health. Um, so I think certainly that's really important um, as to why, you know, it is this species that's being considered um, as for this technology specifically. Um, and just, um, so I talked about Aedes aegypti and that it has really become a very closely adapted to humans. So if you think about a mosquito hanging out in suburban and urban areas and all the different things that occur in suburban and urban areas. So this mosquito is gonna be coming into contact with a lot of different chemicals, a lot of different insecticides. And so um, this has really led to resistance to insecticides within this mosquito species. Um, so the current tools that are being used for mosquito control are not as effective against a species as uh, potentially other species. Um, and certainly the, the type of mosquito control that is, should be used for this um, mosquito is going to be integrated pest management. And and so within integrated pest management, there's going to be source reduction. So getting or trying to get rid of those um, larval habitats um, using larvicides and then um, using adulticides um, and then of using any using additional strategies. And there is resistance um, both to larvicides and um, adulticides in this species. So that is why we need to think about other possibilities for controlling this species because we're, and we, I'd like to, you know, think about the Florida Keys. They have an incredible mosquito control program. Um, I'm so impressed by their IPM strategy that they use there. And they are throwing everything um, to try at trying to control this mosquito species all the you know tools within the IBM IPM toolbox. And there's still cases of dinghy um, occurring. And so this highlights that the current tools that we have, it may not be enough for this species. So um, this is a reason why um, this tool is being explored. Um, so I'm gonna now turn it over to Eric, and he is gonna take it from here. So I'm gonna now stop sharing my screen. Okay. Hi everyone, thanks for attending today. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about the specifics of the technology behind the GM mosquitoes and then my video is off and also um, a little bit about what the preliminary stages of the releases in Monroe County are going to look like. Um, 
So you probably saw a lot of press uh, news articles about the project. Um, and some of them lead with very sensational headlines like uh, 750 million genetically modified mosquitoes to be released. Um, so th this is the reality. This is very likely going to happen in the, in the near future, um, pandemic dependent. Um, the plan is to start at the beginning of 2021 uh, with some trial releases. So what is interesting about this technology um, is that there are actually a lot of advantages. And if you look at the literature that Oxitec has put out in press releases and on its website, uh, they do a very good job of listing what these advantages actually are. So the aim is to suppress or eliminate populations of Aedes aegypti in the Florida Keys. And a couple of the big advantages are firstly that it's male mosquito only and that's very beneficial to the people who live in the area because it's only the females that bite people and transmit disease. So the mosquitoes that they're releasing into the environment will not increase the prevalence of mosquito transmitted disease or the prevalence of mosquito bites. And they're also self-limiting um, because they're male only after releases stop the population of released mosquitoes gradually declines and within a few generations after releases stop, there'll be no more of those mosquitoes in nature. So this is very good because in the very unlikely event that something goes wrong, all they need to do is stop releasing and the mosquitoes would naturally die out. And the, the strategy that they're going to use to release mosquitoes is simplistic and not very labor intensive. So they're taking a box, they put a capsule of eggs in the box, fill it with water and a bit of food, the capsule dissolves, the eggs hatch, and eventually the mosquitoes come out. And because of the genetic modification or transgene, which we'll talk about in a second, all the mosquitoes that come out of the box are male only. All the females die beforehand. Um, yeah. So who is planning the release? So the release is a collaboration between Oxitec and the uh, Florida Keys Mosquito Control District in Monroe County. So a little bit about Oxitec, because you may not all be familiar with them. Oxitec is a biotechnology company that was founded in 2002 in Oxford University in the United Kingdom. And they've spent the last near two decades working on self-limiting mosquito technologies, so GM mosquito technologies. But they've also taken that system from mosquitoes and have been expanding it to other uh, disease vectors and also agricultural pests. So there's a broad applicability of the technology. And since they performed their initial releases of transgenic mosquitoes about a decade ago in the Cayman Islands, they've been strongly focused on doing releases in Brazil, but have also released in Panama and India and have now expanded to Florida. Uh, the product that they're using for the releases is a second generation mosquito technology. Uh, so the, the brand name of that is the Friendly Mosquito, um, but scientifically it's called Ox5034. So it's a, a male mosquito, but transgenic. And of course the partner in this venture is the Mosquito Control District, which Ava mentioned before. Have, they have a very broad suite of activities designed to reduce the size of populations and eliminate mosquito populations from the area. So this mosquito release, uh, the theory behind this is called population suppression. So this, this differs from population replacement, uh, where a mosquito population persists in nature after the intervention. Here, the goal is to remove the population from nature or reduce it dramatically in size. And there are many different avenues to achieving population suppression. This can be insecticides, it can be the sterile insect technique or incompatible male mosquito releases like with Wolbachia um, and Mosquito Mate. They've previously done some releases in Florida. Um, but the goal is the same, to crash the population. 
So if you look at the little figure on the bottom, um, the, the vertical axis is showing you the size of a hypothetical mosquito population. And over time, that would persist as normal with a few fluctuations depending on the seasonality. Um, and what's depicted here in gray is a intervention. So in this case, starting to release transgenic mosquitoes. So if you follow the dashed line, you'll see in this scenario, over time, the proportion of the population that is a GM mosquito is increased and eventually it hits a threshold. And what happens then is that all of the, uh, the wild mosquitoes decline and are eliminated. Um, and here in this example with the Oxitec mosquitoes, because the transgene is self-limiting, they don't persist in nature. So the population is diminished or eliminated and nature continues on without the mosquitoes. So how specifically does the technology work? Well, in this case, the release mosquitoes have two uh, genes that are added to their genome. So the first of these is a color marker known as DSRED2. And what happens here is this is just a system to help the people who are working with the mosquitoes more easily detect the mosquitoes in nature. So if you look at the diagram on the left, there's two larvae. The top larva has the DSRED2 protein being expressed in its tissues and under a certain light, it fluoresces so you can see it bright yellow in this picture and if you look at the larva beneath it it has some auto fluorescence which is why you can see it at all but it's very easily uh, very easy to distinguish between the two mosquitoes so this allows the researchers to go and collect some larvae from nature after the releases have started and look and see what proportion of any mosquito population has the the transgenes or not and that tells them how effective the, uh, the release and the population suppression is going. If it's going well, they would expect to see more fluorescent mosquitoes. If it's not going as they anticipated, maybe uh, there's fewer of them there and they could adjust the release parameters accordingly. Um, so the second gene, um, I'm going to explain this a couple of times because it's a little complicated, once with words and the other with the help of pictures. Um, so this is the self-limiting factor and that gene is known as TTAV or tetracycline repressible transactivator variant. And what this gene does, it causes female specific lethality. So both the males and the females carry the gene, but the protein acts and kills the females, males are fine. And this death occurs before the females can pupate. And what that means is that th when the adults come out of the little box they're using and releases, they're only males. Um, and you might be asking, why do the females die? It's because the TTAV protein uh, stops essential for life genes from being produced by the female uh, larvae. So without these genes active, the larvae cannot develop into pupae and they die. Um, so the released males leave the box and then they find wild females in nature. And because they have a copy of the TTAV gene, they then pass that on to their offspring. But because the gene is female lethal, the female offspring of those males do not survive. Some males do and they continue the suppression, but over time they gradually diminish. And there's also a repressing factor. You may have heard uh, the, of the involvement of tetracycline. And um, when tetracycline is present, it stops the lethal effect. But in the case of this project, tetracycline is only being used in the mosquito colony rearing, which is going to be performed in the United Kingdom. So there'll be no tetracycline involved in the United States. So briefly, just to provide a picture because this can help explain the, the technology a little better for some people like me who learn better by looking at things. Um, so here on the, the right hand, there's a two panel picture. So in the, the blue part, this is how the, uh, the self-limiting TTAV gene works to control mosquitoes. 
So the, the blue jellyfish is the protein. It's produced naturally by the transgenic mosquitoes. And when the protein is present, it goes and binds to the, uh, the DNA of the female mosquitoes and stops essential proteins from being produced. And when that happens, the mosquitoes die. And then on the purple panel, we see what happens when the mosquitoes are being, being reared under laboratory conditions. So the little blue necklace is the tetracycline. And what happens when you add tetracycline to the water, the mosquitoes take it up as they eat and it binds to the TTAV protein and stops it from interacting with the mosquito DNA. So the essential proteins are produced. And this means that in a colony rearing situation, the female uh, larvae would go on to become adults. They can mate with the males who would survive with or without tetracycline and then produce the eggs necessary to uh, put in a little box that will be released into nature. And that's the schematic uh, being described here on the subsequent slide. So tetracycline only used in larval rearing for making colony mosquitoes and eggs in the United Kingdom. Um, after the larval stage, there's no tetracycline involved. The pupae become adults. The adults breed after blood feeding and produce eggs that are put into a capsule. You can see this uh, person here holding a capsule of eggs. And then the eggs are shipped to the United States and put in the uh, release boxes here. And the plan is to deploy these in nature. Um, so again, no females coming out of the box, no tetracycline involved in the box. So what is the, uh, the overview schematic of the approach? So at the moment we're in the, the pre-season phase and the technology transfer and staff training, I believe is underway or mostly completed. Um, Oxitec and the Mosquito Control District are engaging with the community constantly throughout the process. So uh, before releases, during and after. Um, and then they will set up traps to monitor the size and distribution of the local Aedes aegypti population in the intended release areas. Um, and then release the mosquitoes and evaluate how effective the approach was at controlling the population size. And then once releases are terminated, do long-term monitoring to look at the effects of the population. Um, so as I mentioned before, the plan is to start the releases next year. Uh, but as we are in a pandemic and things are a little unprecedented at the moment, uh, they're going to make the final decision on when and where that happens a little later. And they're also going to decide on the exact format of the releases later as well. So if you're interested, Oxitec is running a series of uh, video webinars and there's one scheduled for January that's going to discuss the shape that the releases will take. But what they've listed on their website is that there are two proposed types of field trials. So Project A will uh, look at releasing mosquitoes in a single area and Project B, um, mosquitoes over multiple areas. And I'll go through those a bit more in a second, but I just wanna describe some of the parameters that they're going to look at to gauge whether the um, releases are successful. So they're looking at five different parameters. Firstly, how far do males fly and how long do they live? So just understanding a little bit of the biology of the mosquitoes they're releasing and how long does the suppression effect last? Um, and then looking at natural breeding sites, the percentage of mosquitoes that are female in the area that are killed and the proportion of the wild population in the area that are being treated by the design. Um, so, the first type of release, the single point release, is coming from a single box in nine areas and they're going to conduct that over 12 weeks. So the locations are to be determined um, and that's going to depend on the initial monitoring and the community engagement in the area. Um, so again, this is a single site for the first phase. Um, and if you're wondering, is it a risk that the GM mosquitoes are likely to spread far out of this area? 
Uh, not really, because firstly, the self-limiting nature of the technology means that they will die off completely within a few generations post-release. And then the second Ava touched on before, 80s Egypti actually has a quite limited flight range. So the average mosquito in their lifetime, they don't tend to move more than 100 meters or 330 feet. So they generally stay contained in the area after you um, release them. They don't move too far away. And then the second type, uh, the multiple point release. Um, so there'll be additional traps placed in a site. Uh, the re releases will run a little longer over 16 weeks. And the, this is more of a, um, a trial to try to understand what the impact is on a larger mosquito population. So here they'll be looking at the percentage suppression of the mosquito population uh, in a uh, non-release area compared to the, uh, the multiple release area. And this is uh, the, the key metric, what proportion of the population of mosquitoes has been suppressed. So here in this diagram, um, on the vertical axis, 100% is all of the mosquito population gone. 0% is all the mosquito population still there. And the, this figure is describing a pilot project with mosquitoes that was run by Oxitec in Brazil um, this year over 17 weeks. So what they saw was that they had a fairly rapid onset of mosquito death after they started releasing. And then they eventually they were able to achieve about 90% uh, suppression of the mosquito population. So they're able to remove nine out of 10 mosquitoes in the area. And this is fairly consistent with the, the data they've obtained from their previous trials, both with the generation one mosquitoes and the current um, more recent generation two mosquitoes. So if you look here in the, the, the Cayman Islands in Brazil and also Panama, they're achieving greater than 90% population suppression in all of them. And this is after a few months of mosquito releases. And then with the generation two mosquitoes, you see similar 96% suppression. And that's also true for a larger ongoing study in Sao Paulo and Brazil. Um, so at the moment, there's no peer reviewed papers demonstrating what the effect of the loss of the mosquito population in these areas is on dengue transmission. But we do know from other similar interventions when you knock down the mosquito population uh, to this extent, there's quite a significant impact on dengue transmission. So my hypothesis would be that we'd expect to see something similar when those studies are carried out and the results are published. And if they hold uh, here, we'd expect to potentially see a similar impact on the mosquito population. And I think that takes us to the end of our slides. Super, thank you so much, Eric. So, um, now we are going to begin the portion of the webinar where the, the panel answers questions that um, you guys have submitted during your registration. Additionally, there's been a, a couple of questions that have come in uh, during the presentation. I've made an attempt to answer a couple of those, but I would love to um, provide other panelists with the opportunity to answer those questions as well. So now I'm going to turn it over to Julie. All right. So we're going to go ahead and start with some of these questions that were submitted ahead of time. And uh, we appreciate uh, people who did that. Um, it's, it's nice to have some questions ahead of time, especially if somebody needs to kind of prepare for, for some of these really tricky ones you guys have come up with. Um, so we're going to go ahead and um, we're going to start with Chad. And we want to know if you have encountered any hostile interactions from the public about GM mosquitoes. Wow, uh, that is an open-ended question. And uh, yes, the, uh, the, the way to slam the door on that in an interview would be to say, yes, I have, but uh, 
yes, uh, I, I would say I've in, in, encountered quite a lot of hostile um, uh, feedback from folks. And I, I think that's part of the problem. Um, for whatever reason, and I, I, I would call it, if, if I were writing a, a paper on this, it's somewhere um, in, in the, the future, I would say it's a perfect storm. It is, uh, it, it, there is a, a point of, uh, um, of place where the actual project uh, parameters run amok with uh, emotion. And, and, and once that happens, it gets derailed. And, and a lot of people get to that point of emotional reaction and they shut down their ears and they don't hear anymore. And quite frankly, you can't tell them anything. I mean, um, our, our boss, uh, Andrea uh, Leal ha has heard me on the phone with folks going, so you mean to tell me you know more about this than I do? Because I, I have people to where I start to tell them something that it, they've been so ingrained with what they've been told on the internet, so it must be true um, that that they, they really have absolutely no understanding of what we're trying to do at all. And I mean, I, I've ended conversations more than once and said, we, we really have nothing to talk about. You're not willing to hear what I have to say. And, and there's actually some folks out there that think this is all some Q and non conspiracy that were involved with uh, with Bill Gates. I mean, bring in the tinfoil hats and wrap our heads up. It's it, it's really nuts. So, yeah, uh, I, I I encounter a lot of people. Uh, fortunately, though, by and large, if I talk it, it, out of ten people that take the time to actually listen, out of those ten, eight are usually very, very receptive to what we're doing. And in fact, once they hear what we're trying to do and what our reasoning is for doing it, they're extremely receptive. They're saying, why aren't you, why didn't you do it 10 years ago? Um, so once you get past that emotional hurdle, um, you, we make a lot of headway. Unfortunately, the people that are just diametrically opposed to this know about that hurdle too, and they've manipulated it to no end. So it, it, our problem as communicators is really heavy on the front end of breaking through that uh, snowbank of misinformation and getting to the real truth. But once we get there, and we will get there, um, people will understand what we're doing. Yeah, I think that's where, you know, us, uh, I know as Extension, we're science educators and our, our public health mosquito control people, um, whether they realize it or not, they're also science educators. So they have to be able to at least communicate the basics. But, but it is also important to understand that when somebody has a very um, emotional conviction, you're not going to change their mind and that's okay. Um, you just need to try to, you know, Teach the one the people who are receptive, and you know, don't put yourself into a situation where it's it's going to escalate. Um, yeah, and yeah, I should. Just I, say, I would think for our, I refer to, to your PIO. I come to mosquito control from seventeen years in FDOT. I, I was a PIO manager for uh, Florida's Turnpike Enterprise, which mm -hmm. is part of FDOT. So I am not. Uh, unfamiliar with all manner of controversial subjects. Um, I mean, we did all electronic tolling. We, 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 we sold the concept of express lanes on I-95. All these things had emotion attached to them, but not the fervent emotion that is attached to this. And, and I, I, there, I have a lot of theories as to why it's that way. First of all, a lot of health issues you things have a lot of different types of emotion attached to it. But this also has the uh, Jurassic Park thing uh, mixed in with it. So whoever is trying to sell it as a, as a bad thing, all they have to do is say, you've seen Jurassic Park. And thanks to Steven Spielberg, everybody remembers the mosquito that's frozen in amber, uh, you know, hundreds of, of, of millions of years ago. And that was the root of all the bad problems on Jurassic Park. And that's 
from there, it's uh, it's Katie bar the door. So this is a very unique situation. But like I said, it it's one that it only needs to be combated with one thing, and that's the truth. Mm -hmm. And and speaking of Jurassic Park, I'm going to jump over to Eva because we actually did have somebody who asked, "Have we seen Jurassic Park?" and wants to know, should we should we even be doing this and entertaining this this option? So. <laughs> Absolutely. I've seen Jurassic Park. Uh, <laughs> no doubt. Um, I, I'm not going to really give a lot of time to that first question. To me, it's more of a joke. Um, but I feel like I covered some of the reasons why we should be considering this additional tool for um, mosquito control and, and specifically for um, the, um, the specific mosquito species, Aedes aegypti, the, the dinghy uh, mosquito, yellow fever mosquito, whatever common name you're familiar with <laughs> for this mosquito, um, it, it causes a lot of illnesses and deaths every year. So um, to me, those are really important reasons to consider this. Um, and I certainly welcome other panelists to provide input. Yeah, I say as well, um, this is not the case of a mad scientist on an island by himself cloning dinosaurs from frog embryos. Um, this technology has been well tested for almost two decades now. So they spent the first 10 years of that doing laboratory studies and establishing the foundation of the technology. The TTAB gene has been well tested in many different insect species. So we can go into this knowing that there's very strong science underlying the decisions to release these mosquitoes. So um, another question that came in, and of course this kind of ties back into, I mean, the whole the, you know, reason that this is, is such an important technology is because of the disease transmission um, that these mosquitoes are so successful in. And people specifically ask, can you successive, successfully use GM technology in the middle of a mosquito-borne disease outbreak. Uh, Eva, I think. Um, what I would say is that the release of these mosquitoes, um, as Eric pointed out during his presentation, the exact impact on um, virus transmission has not been um, provided yet. There, there isn't exact data on um, impact on um, disease incidents. But what we do have data on is impact on population size. And there is a decrease in population size with this technology. So, um, and with a re reduction in this species, you will also see the assumption is a reduction in um, disease cases. So um, I, I uh, certainly say that yes, it can be used during uh, an outbreak and I would certainly hazard a guess that it will result in uh, a reduction of disease incidence, though we do not have the specific data to back up that hypothesis. Um, I just want to quickly answer a question that came in from uh, Bill, and he asked, um, or he said, I've heard that saltwater mosquitoes are expected to fill the niche uh, in the Keys when the 80s population uh, declines. Um, so I just want to, um, where the release is, releases are going to be happening. It's in a very focal, very small area. And so, and these mosquitoes are incredible at reproducing. And this technology, if you stop the releases after a certain point, there is going to be the possibility of introduction of um, other mosquitoes back into that area. So that the population can certainly um, increase after that, um, after the releases stop. 
So this is not going to lead to any type of, well, it would certainly be incredible if it does lead to eradication of the species in that area. I find it you know, very high, very unlikely. Um, so I don't think that we're actually gonna have an issue with feeling the niche, but again, this is an invasive species. Mm -hmm. It does not have a natural niche in this ecosystem or in, um, you know, the, our ecosystems. Um, and um, in terms of will salt marsh mosquitoes fill that niche? Um, no. Um, and the reason I say that is because Aedes aegypti is so closely tied to using containers, um, human um, provided containers for its um, immature mosquito habitats and um, saltwater mosquitoes, um, they're going to need to um, have salinity and they're um, um, usually going to be, you know, in large bodies of water that have um, salt in them to breed. So very, very different habitats um, and um, really don't expect there to be a complete um, decimation of the Aedes aegypti population long-term. Okay. So um, Chad, are the GM mosquitoes EPA certified? I don't know what the, 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 what the term in that context means by EPA certified. The, the trial is uh, approved uh, by okay. the EPA and and by the uh, you know by the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services and uh, seven other different uh, regulatory agencies underneath them. So yeah, I, they they've met the stamp of approval from um, every regulative uh, body uh, that uh, that that needs to pass muster. I mean that they need to pass muster and and not only I wouldn't say they're just approved. They're approved with flying colors. I, I've read that stuff from cover to cover, and and uh, there's been a lot of ground that's been covered in those by those agencies, and and you know these things. There's a lot of other things to worry about besides these mosquitoes. That's that's what I tell folks. Okay. So, um, Eva, do you know if um, FDAX or Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services? will be doing any type of statewide education for people that are concerned about the use of this technology. You're muted. I have a feeling we probably have some attendees from FTAX on this um, webinar. So if you want to provide your input um, in the chat box, if you're going, if you have plans for um, providing a uh, statewide webinar. Um, personally, I don't see why this can't be used for that. Um, this webinar is going to be recorded and it's going to be available um, on FMEL's website. So um, I hope that this can certainly be beneficial for you know whatever those needs are. Okay. Um, so Eric, Yes. How do you distinguish between GM mosquitoes and those that are injected with the Wolbachia to the public? Sure. Um, so the end result of both of those techniques, if you're doing population suppression, is the mosquito population size is diminished. So functionally, they're identical. Um, the efficacy of both techniques is high. So Wolbachia, for those who don't know, is an endosymbiotic bacterium that has been artificially introduced into Aedes aegypti and a couple of other mosquito species. And it naturally spreads into wild mosquito populations, but can also crash those populations by releasing only male mosquitoes. So uh, once you have the mosquito lines, either the Wolbachia or the uh, Oxitec GM mosquitoes, it comes down to a choice between what the people who are regulating uh, feel about it, what the community feels about it, um, and then also 
you know, the, the relative cost of either approach to it. But again, fundamentally, they're both quite similar. So they, it's releasing male mosquitoes. Um, if you mean actually detecting the difference between the two, that's a simple PCR assay. Okay. Um, Eva, do you know uh, which, which mosquito control districts in Florida are using GM mosquitoes? So um, these trials are only going to be occurring in the Florida Keys. So there is a no other mosquito control district that is going to be using this exact technology um, in Florida. There, um, there are going to possibly be trials in Texas. Um, I can't speak on, um, you know, if those trials are, are going as going to move forward as planned, because um, I'm not really up to date on um, mosquito control issues in Texas. But I do know that um, the initial plan was for um, the releases in the Keys, just in the Keys in Florida and um, in Texas. Okay, and, and this kind of ties into this. Um, Eric, would GM mosquitoes be practical in a bigger county or are they better for um, like an island or small isolated area like the Keys? So I think it's a really good thing to start with a really isolated area. And that's been uh, the case for these Oxitec mosquitoes. So they started on the island in the Caymans and similar technology. So the use of Wolbachia was started in uh, very restricted and isolated geographic areas in Australia. Um, and that way, if anything goes wrong, it's easy to contain. And nothing so far has gone wrong. Um, so that, that's good. Um, since then, in the case of Wolbachia, it has moved on to, for instance, being deployed across whole cities in Rio de Janeiro and also in Indonesia. Um, and the challenge there is one of logistics because you move beyond something that a lab group or a mosquito control district can do by themselves. You're talking teams of 500 peoples with a factory producing millions of mosquitoes every, every week or every month. Um, so that, that's the hard thing to get a handle on. You need to have a facility to make the mosquitoes that's close by. Um, mm -hmm. And then you need to have the team on the ground that can manage the releases and the surveillance. Um, so once that's in place, and assuming there's a financial backing for it, um, it seems to work quite effectively. But again, it's a matter of uh, people and resources. Okay. And, and you mentioned um, the financial side. Somebody had asked what it costs to do this. And we're going to direct that one at Chad. Well, the, 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 the way I answer that is uh, right now is nothing. Uh, it, it, it's costing uh, Florida Keys Mosquito Control uh, nothing to, to use this technology under the uh, terms of what have been approved by the federal government and the local government. So the trial is not the, the taxpayers not paying anything for the trial um, that that's being that cost is being borne by the uh, uh, by the contractor or the potential contractor or the, the agreement holder Oxitec in this case. So I I don't know. I don't even have a hazard to guess as to how uh, cost prohibitive it is. So my answer to the public when they ask is it, this is very much a methodical step by step process. It's never been done before let's get through the first test. And that is let's see if it works in real world Florida Keys before we worry about, uh, you know, how we're gonna pay for it and how much it's gonna cost. Let's see if it works first and then and then we'll go from there. So I honestly don't know. Okay, and, and, and that, I, I think that answers the question quite well, really. Um, so I'll stick with Chad here. Um, how, how do they transfer the genetics to the endemic population? And if you want to pass that off to Eric, you can. I had a note that this was. Yeah, I would say anytime you're using more than two or three syllables, you should probably pass it off to Eric. <laughs> Eric, do you want to answer that one? Sure, yeah. Um, okay. So in the box, you have female and male eggs for the mm -hmm. Oxitec mosquitoes. And 
as they turn into larvae, uh, there's no tetracycline, so the females die. And that means you're left with only male larvae that become pupae and then adults and fly out of the box. Once they're out of the box, they do their natural mosquito thing. They go and find female mosquitoes to mate with. And there they pass half their genetics to their offspring, which share half the genetics with the wild females. Um, and because of the transgene, the TTAV, those offspring, all the females die, only the males persist. So there's a bit of commingling of the genetics there in the, the next generation male mosquitoes. But because the technique is self-limiting and because the local population is decreasing in size quite rapidly, it becomes much harder for those males to find mates. So that means that over time, as the population declines even further, there's less of a chance that the genetic background of the Oxitec mosquitoes mixes with those wild mosquitoes. And eventually you're left with just a tiny proportion of the population that dies out. All right. So Eva, uh, there was a question that came in that says, there is at least one study showing an increase in West Nile virus load for Culex mosquitoes. Or is there any concern about that? So I'm going to be perfectly honest and just say that I'm not familiar with that study. Um, if whoever sent in that question um, would like to provide me with that, um, the link to that study, I'd certainly be interested in looking at it. Um, I would say in reference to Aedes aegypti and um, the possibility um, of that vector um, being able to um, transmit or um, um, being able to have a contain a higher viral load of um, dengue virus or something like that. Um, I would just make sure, I just want people to make sure that if, so, if that's being suggested in a study that there is data to back that up. Um, so again, I refer back to the, um, the study that was published in scientific uh, reports. Um, it stated that there was a possibility of, of hybrid vigor from the release and um, could lead to um, higher rates of transmission. But again, there was no data provided for that. Um, so certainly, you know, I'm, I'm not familiar with the QLEX study, but in general, I just wanna make sure we um, continue to be vigilant about looking for um, the actual data supporting um, statements that are made in papers. Um, and there was actually a question that came in during the webinar that I wanted to uh, answer live. Um, so the question is, what I heard uh, was that some GIA mosquitoes have been released in the Keys and the homestead area since the population is so much more, than, sorry, is, uh, less this year. Any comments on this? So this is a misinformation. Um, this is not accurate. No, this is, there have been no releases made. Um, and, you know, this is really why I, this webinar is occurring so that we can provide the participants, you guys, the attendees with the real facts so that when you hear thing, you know, people come with uh, misinformation like this, you can combat that misinformation. Um, so that's really the goal of what this webinar, um, the, the webinar's goal. So um, I certainly hope that everyone is able to combat misinformation like that. <laughs> so thank you for that opportunity. Yeah, that, that's a good question um, be, because I'm sure that there's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, so Eric, what is the difference between um, what the Keys mosquito control is doing and the sterile insect technique that's commonly used. Well, again, the, the effect is similar. So both uh, the Oxitec mosquito releases and the sterile insect 
technique. The goal is to suppress or eliminate mosquito populations. But there's differences between the two of them in how easy it is to deploy and prepare the mosquitoes and also the quality of the mosquitoes being released. So with the sterile insect technique, you need to sterilize the female mosquitoes and that's done chemically or by radiation. Please forgive my cat stretching in the background. Um, <laughs> and that has a, a fitness cost on the males that are eventually released. So they're less competitive and less able to find a mate than wild mosquitoes after they're released. Uh, so the quality of the material is lower. And then there's also the issue of you don't want to release female mosquitoes that bite with these uh, uh, releases. So you need to separate the male from the female pupae. Uh, that's the stage it's normally done at. And historically, that's been very laborious. Um, there have been some advancements, uh, mechanical separators that split male and female pupae by size, but there's still an inherent error rate. So you have uh, females that are accidentally released. Um, but where the technology has progressed has been this genetic sexing, and that's what's being used here in the Oxitec releases. So genetically adding a gene or removing a gene to ensure that female larvae don't survive for the releases. Um, so putting that in place here means deploying this technology into the field makes things much, much easier for the people who are growing the mosquitoes. And because the males that Oxitec is releasing are not at a fitness disadvantage or a competitive disadvantage compared to the wild mosquitoes, uh, things proceed easier in the field. So they're more able to find a mate, which means that the efficacy of crashing the population is higher than it would be for the sterile insect technique. So, yeah. That, that makes sense. And it sounds like there's a potential for it to maybe be less cost prohibitive in the future if there's less uh, labor involved in trying to sort them out. Um, just Absolutely. Yeah. From, from um, my standpoint. <laughs> there are actually, if you look at some uh, Verily videos, there are giant machines now that can separate mosquitoes by sex. So you add the eggs at the start and at the end you get the male mosquitoes. Wow. Um, while we're talking about kind of the life cycle here, we had a couple of questions come in um, asking about the lifespan of the GM mosquitoes. Do you know if there's a difference in the lifespan of them compared to the, the wild? Um, I haven't seen exact data on that. Uh, they claim mm -hmm. there's no fitness costs. Um, okay. So that would put that the, the lifespan of the males is less than two weeks. Okay. And then um, somebody else asked you a little bit more specifically, it, do you know if the, the larval stage is similar on the GM and the non-GM? Um, again, yeah, they, they haven't shared the specifics on the second okay. generation mosquitoes because there's no publications on it yet, but they say there's yeah. no fitness costs. So that would mean a development period of, you know, six days to 10 days or so. Yeah, that, that, that's the number that I, I trust me. I've been talking to them quite a bit recently. And yeah, that's the number that we use is there's uh, there's no no change in that regard. They develop as, okay. as a regular 80s. Good. Um, we had another question come in. Um, do the Oxytec mosquitoes fluoresce at the adult stage? Do either Eric or I'm going to admit that I do not know the answer to that question, um, but I think it's incredibly interesting. Do you know if the fluorescence um, is able to make it to the adult stage, Eric? It generally does, but because the cuticle has scales and it's a bit more opaque, it's harder to see. Um, you can still see it in the eyes quite well. Uh, DS red is a very common fluorescent marker that people use to make transgenic mosquitoes. And then, um, Eva, did you want to ask the question um, as it related to the septic tank? I think you might understand that question a little bit better on the chat. Um, so there was a question about if there's a, a likelihood of, or what would happen with, if the 
oxy if the mosquitoes that are in the environment if they come in contact with um, outflow from sewage that maybe contains tetracycline. So um, I would certainly um, make the case that this is um, the site that, and or the multiple sites that um, Florida Keys Mosquito Control and OxyTech are gonna be selecting for um, these releases. There's going to be a lot of um, research that goes into site selection. Um, so I think they would certainly, and Chad, you can back me up on this. I would certainly think that um, the sites that are selected are going to be selected um, based on one of the reasons they're chosen would be that they're unlikely to flood from whatever um, source of water that is. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, we haven't gotten, I mean, this, the conversations that I've been involved in haven't, haven't surrounded that particular issue. But yeah, I, there is a lot of things that are going into the site selection. So I can only imagine uh, the, you know, ha, that the environment, whether it's conducive or not, it, it, it are, are, are something. And I don't know that, that even with, uh, and uh, even with the, their exposure to tetracycline, I'm not sure that that has a, a, a would have a, an effect. I, I, I don't know. I, I know that that, uh, that the tetracycline issue, at least as it's been presented as being a problem, um, it receives a lot of credibility because uh, the, one of the people that really uh, is using that as an argument as a physician in Key West, and he has used it ad nauseum uh, uh, as, a, as a reason to vote this down. And I know that Oxitec and ourselves have said that it's, it's not going to be an issue with this particular mosquito, particularly the ones that are, are used in the United States. So I, I think that's a non-starter as an issue. Okay. Well, we're getting really close to... Um... Well, two o'clock for me, three o'clock for everybody in the Eastern time zone. And we got folks all over the place that have different different times. Um, so Chad, do you have any final comments or anything else that you want to share um, to the audience about, about this program or about how to communicate with the public? Uh, just, uh, just real briefly, uh, I, we un certainly understand all the emotion that's involved in it. And, and, and the further we get into it, the more I personally understand uh, why there's so much just misinformation out there, you just have to tell people to um, have patience and to take time and to listen to it. And, and when they bring up that, have you seen the movie Jurassic Park? I respond and say, yes, I have seen it. But, you know, more close to me right now is I'm living the reality show of Dengue in Key Largo. And that one's a lot scarier. Um, that that that, it, it, and then I remind them that the dengue is also called bone break disease for a reason. So, if you're talking about a movie and make believe and things that are nice and have a lot of pretty bows on them, that's one thing. But the reality of dengue in the public in a neighborhood in Key Largo, um, with a lot of people very close together, very very sick, that reality is a lot more frightening. Absolutely. All right, Eva, do you have any final remarks? I would just um, say that I hope this webinar was beneficial and um, thank all of the attendees for joining us. Um, and I'm gonna try, I don't know. I was thinking I'll try and share the um, slide again that has our email addresses um, just so that if anyone has follow-up questions, um, you can try and um, contact us via email. Um, so I'm going to try and see where that is. Boop, boop. I'm on it right now. I can share it. Oh, that'd be great. Thank you. And, and we can also send out a follow-up email with, um, with that information to, it would go to whoever was registered on Zoom, the email address we have on file. So for a lot of you, 
maybe one person registered you. And so that person would, if they would just please share the information with anyone else at the facility, that, that would be great. And so just one final question that was asked is, um, at which instar do the female larvae die or do they do as, do they die as pupae? Um, so my understanding is that they die as larvae. Um, I'm not sure exactly which instar, um, if Eric or Chad have an answer, I certainly welcome it. But that is certainly something I can look into. Yeah. So I can't expand beyond that either. It's not on the uh, website. Uh, my, I, from everything I've heard in the, and again, I, I always uh, couch these by saying that, you know, my background's in journalism, I'm not a biologist, but uh, everything that I've heard explained to me is this is an enzyme, a, a reaction um, that, that happens, uh, this, it, it happens relatively early. Um, in, in the process. I don't know exactly, I don't think I ever got that specific, but my understanding is it happens very early in that process. Okay, well again, um, for anyone that has more questions, you've got our contact information here, so please feel free to follow up with us. Um, thank you so much for joining us, and we will see you next time. Yep.